Well, good morning again, church. Let's turn our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4 today. Ephesians chapter 4. So we start this new series, The Church in Action, Ephesians chapter 4. When the film Saving Private Ryan, four brothers are serving in the army during World War II. Three of them end up dying, so in order to prevent the Ryan family from losing all their children in the war, Captain John Miller is tasked with leading a troop of seven men to track down this lone private, James Francis Ryan, and bringing him home to his grieving parents. But of course, in order for the troop to do this, they must put their own lives at risk. And after one of the men dies in combat, the rest of the men begin to question the legitimacy of this mission. Why should they put themselves in harm's way to bring this one guy home? It just doesn't seem right. Didn't seem fair. Even Captain Miller has his doubts, saying, this Ryan better be worth it. He'd better go home and cure some disease or invent a longer-lasting light bulb or something. Nevertheless, Miller and his crew press on, and they ultimately track Ryan down and succeed in their mission, but it came at great cost because all but two of the men were killed during the process, including Captain Miller. But before Miller dies, knowing that Ryan is going to get to go home, be reunited with his family, is going to have a chance to build a life and live well into old age, while Miller is never going to get to go home, he's never going to see his wife again, he pulls Ryan in close and in fact declares to him one final order. Earn this. In other words, we've given up everything, our families, our futures, even our own lives, all so that you can have this shot at life. Also, your family name doesn't die with your brother's deaths. So don't you dare go home and waste this gift you've been given. You better make our sacrifice worth it. You better live a good life. You better earn this. Now, when it comes to the gospel... Paul has spent the last three chapters showing us that there's nothing we can do to earn this. We're sinners by nature. We're dead in our trespasses, strangers to the covenant, cut off from God's presence. There's absolutely nothing we can do to earn a relationship with God. Neither is there any way that we can pay him back for what he's done. But nevertheless, in light of this grace that we have received, Paul is now going to call us to action. To pull us close like Miller and tell us, don't you dare waste this. Indeed, he says in verse 1, walk worthy of this. He says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Now, anytime we see the word therefore, we should ask, what's it there for? Because the word shows that a conclusion is being drawn based on something that has already been said. And for three chapters, Paul has been laying out for us all kinds of theology, showing us the glorious mystery of what God has been doing behind the scenes for all eternity. How long before God made us, he was pursuing us. Or to use the language here, he was calling us. But what is this calling Well, obviously it doesn't mean God's hitting you up on your cell phone or something, although that would be pretty cool, wouldn't it? But no, Paul, when he speaks of calling, he's talking about when God calls us to salvation. Look at 1 Corinthians 1.21. It says, For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach, listen, to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs, Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews, folly to Gentiles, but, what, to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Romans 8.30 likewise says, and those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. That is, he saved. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Do you see this connection in scripture between calling and salvation? Indeed, the power of this calling is perhaps best displayed when Jesus visited the tomb of his friend Lazarus, who had been sealed inside his grave for four days. Now, y'all, I'm not a medical expert by any means, but I'd say that's pretty dead, right? And yet, after rolling the stone away, all Jesus had to do was call out to his friend with these three words, Lazarus, come out. And it says, the man who had died came out. And that's exactly what Paul said happened to us. 
He says, spiritually speaking, we were just as dead as Lazarus, that because of our sin, we were incapable of helping ourselves. We were strangers, outcasts, lifeless, with the rigor mortis of the soul. And that's where we would have stayed, except for the best two words in the Bible. But God, we were dead, it says, but God made us alive together in Christ by grace you have been saved. So it's not by anything good we've done, not because we worked our way back to him, because again, we were dead on the ground. No, it's not until he called us by name like he did with Lazarus, and he told you to come out of that grave, and out you came. Not by your might, not by your power, but by his spirit. Because just like on that first day of creation, when God speaks stuff, happens. And aren't you thankful he spoke? Aren't you thankful he called your name? Because long before he ever made you, he loved you. Indeed, he purposed in his heart to adopt you. When you were least worthy of his love, his son died to redeem you, and his Holy Spirit awakened you, causing you to be born again, sealing you and securing you, not only for your eternal salvation, but for your future glory and inheritance. Friend, you deserved none of this. In fact, you deserve the exact opposite. But though you deserve the lowest hell, God has exalted you in Christ to the highest heavens. Why? I mean, just wrap your brain around that. What would make God want to do something like that for people like us? From a human perspective, it doesn't seem to make any good sense. God had every reason in the world to obliterate every single one of us. And yet for some strange reason... He chose to love us. He refused to give up on his image in us. And by Christ's sacrifice on the cross on our behalf, he has called us out of darkness into his light. He's called us out of exile, into his kingdom, out of death and into life. And all you have to do is believe. It's by grace you have been saved, not by works. This is the glory of the calling. So, awesome. You might be thinking, man, my salvation doesn't depend on anything I do. That's great. I'm saved by grace through faith. I'm so glad I know that because I believe. So now I can do whatever I want to do, and I'm good. Because I got fire insurance, baby. So I can watch whatever I want. I can say whatever I want. I can take whatever I want. I can drink however much I want. I can sleep with whomever I want. And I don't need to worry about a thing because I believe. But friends, that's not how grace works. A true encounter with God's grace doesn't leave us in our sin. It delivers us from sin. Indeed, chapter 2, when Paul tells us we're saved by grace through faith, he sets up our resurrected life in contrast to our old way of life. Look at verse 1. It says that we once walked in our sins and trespasses. We once followed the prince of the power of the air. We once lived in the passions of our flesh. We once carried out the desires of the body. But God... But God made us alive. So in other words, there's no way we go back to this. As Paul will tell us in a few more verses, we must no longer live as the pagan Gentiles do. So listen, grace isn't freedom to sin. Grace is freedom from sin. So great, you might be thinking, that's cool. I'll just avoid doing some of these really bad things, and I'll just otherwise sit back and relax until Jesus returns. But again, that's not how grace works either. Grace isn't a call to passivity Grace is a call to action. Indeed, while we are saved by grace and not by works, we are nevertheless saved by grace for good works. Indeed, Paul tells us so in 2.10. He said, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, for what? For good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Listen, God didn't save us merely to be trophies to sit up on a shelf. He redeemed us to be tools to advance his kingdom as he showcases his glory through our transformed lives. And that's why Paul here, he tells us to get moving. He says to walk, no longer as Gentiles, no longer as dead men continuing in our old way of life, but what? To walk in a manner worthy of the calling. Not in order to earn it, as Captain Miller said, but rather as a result of having received it. In other words, having experienced God's grace, we now walk as those transformed by his grace in a matter fitting with his grace that we have been called to. Because if we are children of God, we should act like it. If we've been redeemed by Christ, 
We should see the fruit of it. If we've been sealed by the Spirit, our lives should reflect the kingdom we're destined for. And so we're walking away from our old selves. We're walking into the new creation we've been created for. Because he has called us by name. He has given us his name. We belong to him. And so we walk with him. And what does that look like? Well, in our passage today, we see it's reflected in how we treat other people. He says, verse 2, that we walk with all humility and gentleness. Now, this would have gone completely against the grain of the culture in Ephesus because in Greek and Roman culture, you were taught to take pride in your name. The ancient world, for the most part, had a shame and an honor culture. So the worst thing that can happen to you is if you lost your clout in the public square. So to humble yourself in any way would have been to put yourself in a position of weakness, to open yourself up to disgrace, to lose power and influence and respect. And not much has changed today, has it? Any talk of humility these days will get you laughed out of many circles. These days it's all about shout louder, troll people harder, never admit when you're wrong, do whatever it takes to win, even if it means slandering your opponents. Because it's not about loving and serving your neighbors and working for their good. It's all about advancing yourself. That's how you get ahead. As one prominent public figure said not too long ago, he said, I understand the biblical reference, but turning the other cheek... That has gotten us nothing, as he then tried to rally a crowd of young people to try another strategy, because humility to him portrayed not strength, but weakness. And we shouldn't be surprised to see that mentality in the world, because pride is the root of all sin. It's what brought about the fall in the first place, when Adam and Eve placed themselves above the very God of the universe, committed treason against the king of creation. And that's why pride is also the antithesis of the gospel itself. Because it forgets who we were before Christ. Because remember how this all started. The only thing we were worthy of was the wrath of God. We were on the outside. We were hellbound. That's why the highest ideal in the kingdom of God is not self-promotion, but poverty of spirit. Why? Because the entry point in the kingdom is acknowledging he's great. I'm not I'm a sinner. I deserve to die, which then leads me to mourn in brokenness over my sin. And Jesus promises that those who are poor in spirit, who weep over their helpless state, are actually blessed. Indeed, it says they will be comforted. They will inherit the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because they recognize their need for him. See, everything that Paul has been telling us for the last three chapters should put us in exactly this state of mind. Because again, we were helpless. We were wretched. We were children of the devil. We don't deserve to be here, but God. That's why Paul says there's no room for boasting. And so Paul calls us into this posture of humility, not to think much of ourselves, but to think much of Christ, who though he was equal with God, humbled himself to the point of death, a death he didn't even deserve because he never sinned, but he was willing to die for us. The very God against whom we had sinned, it says, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And if that's what God did for us when we least deserved it, how could our posture be anything but his? To walk humbly. Indeed, we recognize our status before him, that we are the creature. He's the creator. We're the sinner. He's the savior. We're the child. He's the father. Do you see how that just radically affects everything? How do I walk worthy? By recognizing who I am in relation to God, by yielding and submitting to him, by loving him, by obeying him, by bending the knee before him. But this state of humility doesn't end with my relationship with God. Because as Jesus taught us in the great commandments, if we truly love God, we will also love our neighbor. That's why Paul doesn't just call us to humility, the understanding our position before God. He calls us to gentleness in our relationship with one another. Because as I truly begin to understand who I am in relation to God, a sinner saved by grace, how can I be anything but gentle and understanding with my neighbor? Now listen, when most people hear the word gentleness, as with humility, they tend to think of weakness. I mean, try calling a dude gentle and you just might get punched in the face. But the word here for gentle doesn't mean weak or effeminate. 
In fact, it is used to refer to someone who leads him or herself well, who is not driven by passions, but is in control of his faculties. Think of the designation gentleman. What does that refer to? Well, it referred to someone who was well-mannered, chivalrous, civilized, in contrast to someone who was rude, slovenly, unkept, vulgar. And that's what the term gets at here. Indeed, as we saw with meekness in the Sermon on the Mount, this characteristic describes someone who has power under control, who knows how to use his power and influence, not with recklessness, but rather for the benefit of those around him. He's not governed by his passions or emotions. Instead, he knows how to rein them in for godly purposes, kind of like a tamed animal, a horse that is now rideable because it is power under control versus a wild stallion who is power unbridled and is only going to buck off its rider. So we see with gentleness, Paul's calling us to be people of self-control in our relationship with one another. And how does this look? Well, he tells us how we should treat each other. He says, treat each other with patience, bearing with one another in love. Now, you might be thinking, well, that's just so precious. That's tender, right? Like, be patient, bear with one another. I mean, doesn't that just make you feel all warm and fuzzy inside? But listen, that's not what Paul's getting at here. It's not like, hey, guys, let's gather around the campfire, okay? We're going to roast some marshmallows. We're going to cry. We're going to sing some kumbaya. Now, remember who he's talking to. He's talking to a bunch of Gentiles who are now coming together with Jews to form a new man. And lest you forget, Jews and Gentiles were once enemies. Ethnically, culturally, morally, you couldn't have two types of people more diametrically opposed to one another. I mean, the Jews are wanting to go all snip, snippity, snip on everybody, and the Gentiles are chowing down on lobster and prosciutto. So some are coming into the church from more of a self-righteous legalistic background. Others are coming in with quite the colorful and licentious past. So, I mean, this is a situation that is just ripe for conflict. Indeed, Paul's constantly having to address this throughout the New Testament. For instance, with one church in Corinth, Paul has to address some church members who think they can be holy and still shack up with prostitutes, even as he's having to encourage other church members to still sleep with their spouses because they thought they were being more holy by abstaining from sex even within marriage. I mean, talk about a cultural clash going on here. But friends, this is a reminder for us today that as people are coming to faith and entering the church, they are coming from all sorts of different backgrounds. They've had different upbringings, different experiences, different traumas, different sins. And so what does Paul have to tell them? Hey, guys, chill out. Be patient with one another. Bear with one another. Because coming together as a new person is hard work. It's easy to talk about this in theory or even to exercise it with people who are like us, who think like us, who are wired like us. But what about that person at church who is not like us? The one who drives you crazy or who does things differently than you would, who hurt your feelings, whether intentionally or unintentionally, or who comes across as rude or insensitive. You're telling me even them? And Paul says, yeah. Even them. Bear with them. Be patient with them. Why? Because listen, friend, God was patient with you. I mean, do you think it's been a cakewalk to love you? Think of all the times you screwed up and God didn't walk out on you. No, in fact, he was long suffering with you, refusing to give up on you, though you deserved it. And he carried the cost for it himself. So if God has been patient with you, if he put up with you, Don't you think you can put up with your brother or your sister in Christ? Because what unites us is far greater than anything that could divide us. Indeed, Paul says we should be, verse 3, eager, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Notice this isn't a passive process. Peace doesn't just naturally happen. It takes effort. And Paul doesn't just say we should work for unity. He says we should be eager for it. Jesus likewise told us that we, should be, we would be blessed when we make peace. In the words of Ken Sand, all of us have the tendency to either break peace, that is to cause conflict, or to fake peace, which is to ignore conflict. But Jesus calls us not to break peace or fake peace, but to make peace by going to our brother or sister and working through whatever is dividing us. 
Because we know division doesn't come from God, but the enemy who's trying to destroy the good work that God has begun. But we all stand up and we say, not on our watch, not today, Satan, right? We're going to work this out. We're not going to let him have a foothold because Paul doesn't tell us to create unity or work toward unity. What does he say? He says we are to maintain unity. That means the unity already exists. Why? Because the church is marked by unity in its very essence, in its very nature. Why? Because we have been brought together by the Spirit, Jew, Gentile, slave, free, male, female. It says we are all being built together as a people with one foundation. Therefore, again, what unites us is far greater than anything that could divide us. Indeed, he says, everything about your status as an adopted child of God should push you toward unity with every other child of God. Because, verse 4, he says, there is one body and one spirit We'll talk about this more next week, but this is a common metaphor for Paul. He says we are all members of the same body, that in Christ we are now Christ's body with Christ as the head. Therefore, we function as one unit. Do you ever stop and think about the marvel that is the human body? You know, I was out running errands the other day, and as I was walking to my car, I suddenly became aware of something that most of us pay no attention to at all. See, my legs were just moving beneath me in the direction that I wanted to go without any conscious thought on my part. I didn't stop and inform my body, okay body, now I want to walk to the car. I didn't command my legs to get moving. There was no delay between my initial inclination to begin my trek and the movement of my body. It was all instantaneous. Everything was working in complete synergy, why? Because it was my body. And being part of one body means everything works together in unity. It would be a diseased body that did not have this kind of unity. And that's just with our cars, going to our cars, y'all. Think about the rapid way all of this happens when a superstar athlete is functioning at the top of his game. Or a rock musician is jamming out. Or a mom is just juggling five to ten tasks at one time. Isn't it amazing how the body just naturally moves in sync? Paul says we have that level of unity because we have one head and we have his mind. But we're even more unified than that. Paul says we have one spirit. Every believer has the spirit of God dwelling within him, guiding him according to God's word. That means the same spirit that is in you is in me. And if that's the case, then that means we're also being guided by the same spirit. So if we're all filled with the same spirit, if the same fullness of God dwells within us, how could there be any disunity in our midst? Unless someone is not in step with the spirit. And when that happens, it's easy for us to just assume it's the other person. But what if it's you? Maybe that person isn't as annoying as you think. Maybe you're just having a bad day. Maybe your opinion is the right one, but your posture in presenting your opinion didn't reflect the attitude of Christ. Maybe you were wronged, but you made the problem worse by talking about it to others or by passive-aggressively avoiding the person now. But brothers and sisters, that can't be. Because we have one body. We have one spirit. But if that's not enough, Paul goes on to say we have one hope. In other words, in addition to being the same body, guided by the same mind, we're also all moving in the same direction. Why? Because those whom he called, he told us, he also justified. He also glorified. That means we're all destined for glory. That's our hope. That we have a glorious inheritance awaiting us. In other words, we're going to spend eternity together So we better get used to living together now. In his essay, The Weight of Glory, C.S. Lewis said it this way. He says, it is a serious thing to remember that the dullest and most uninteresting person you talk to may one day be a creature which, if you saw it now, you would be tempted to worship. All day long, he says, we are in some degree helping each other to this destination. He says, there are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. In other words, that person you can barely stand to be in the same room with right now, if they are in Christ by the time he is done with them, they are going to be so glorious, completely sinless, transformed by the glory of God, that you won't be able to get enough of them. You'll want to be with them all the time because they will at last perfectly reflect the goodness of God in the world. Doesn't that just change your perspective of them right now? 
Doesn't that make you want to be patient with them, to bear with them right now, knowing what glory awaits them? Why not, instead of being annoyed or frustrated or angry with them, you prayed for them the same way Paul taught us to pray last week, that they would be strengthened with power through his spirit in their inner being, that Christ would dwell in their hearts through faith, that they would be rooted and grounded in love, that they would know the love of Christ and be filled with the fullness of God. And what if you prayed that for yourself? Two, can you imagine what God might do if all his people were praying that type of prayer with that type of posture toward everyone in this place? Oh, but Ricky, 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 I don't think you get it. I mean, this person is a real piece of work. It would be a miracle if they were ever to change at all. And to that, I would just say Paul's words last week. Now to him who's able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or think. Friend, pray for that miracle. Ask him to change that person. And listen, ask him to change you too. Because I hate to break it to you, but someone is being patient with you right now. You're still in need of his grace right now. Indeed, that person you need to bear with might actually be bearing with you right now. So let's patiently bear with one another because we're all destined for glory. We all have the same hope. But Paul says we also all have, verse 5, one Lord. One Lord. Now why is that important? Because even though this unity should be inherent to us, because we are one body with the same spirit moving in the same direction, we know that we still live in a fallen world. So we're not perfect yet. Yes, we're a new creation, but we still need to put that old man to death. So isn't it good to know that we all answer to the same guy? So even if we go through seasons where in our flesh we can't stand each other, it's helpful to remember that we all still love the same Lord. And if we all both love the same Lord, then we are both obligated to continue to love one another. Indeed, Jesus told us as much. The night before his crucifixion, he said to his disciples, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. Why? Because Jesus says, I love that person so much that I laid down my life for him or her. The same blood that redeemed you, redeemed them. When you least deserved it, I gave up my life so that you could live. And if I loved you like that, how could you not have that same love for the person who least deserves it from you? The truth is you can't. Indeed, 1 John 4.20 says, He who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. Jesus even told us that this is the evidence that we are his disciples. If we love one another. Indeed, the same night before his crucifixion, Jesus prayed for all of us who would one day believe and listen to what he asked God for. He prays that we would be one. He says, you, Father, are in me, and I in you. Let them also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. How will the world know that Jesus is the real deal? Jesus puts it all on the line with his church. He says, by the unity of my people, as they yield to and submit to my authority, as they obey my command to love one another, that's how you will know this is real. After all, it is only by his grace and his sacrifice that any of us are even here in the first place. That's why Paul says in addition to all this, we also all only have one faith. We have one faith. All of us were once walking down the path that led to death until Paul told us in chapter 1, we heard the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation, and we believed in him. We believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. We believe that while we were sinners who deserved to be separated from him, he came and took the punishment we deserve. We believe he rose from the dead, making it possible for all who believe no longer to perish but have eternal life. We receive these things. We believe these things. That's how we were saved. In addition to that, Paul also tells us we have one baptism. Because having believed, we now publicly identify with Christ. We join his church, dying to our old selves, being raised to new life in him. So in other words, we all entered the kingdom the same way, by faith, through baptism. So listen, no one deserves to be here more. No one deserves to be here less. We are all only here by his grace and for his glory, which is why Paul closes out his appeal to unity by reminding us of how this all started. Look at verse 6. He reminds us that there is one God and Father of all. In other words, 
we all got the same daddy, which means we family. Now, I know in our earthly families, blood relations does not equal peace and harmony all the time. Maybe you and your siblings were at each other's throats growing up, but even still, I bet if anyone went after your brother or your sister, you were like, oh, I don't think so. It's about to be on like Donkey Kong, right? Because I can beat my brother up all I want, but if anyone else tries, right, they're going to have to go through me. Well, again, Paul is saying that we might have lots of differences, but what unites us is far greater than what divides us because we've all been adopted by our Heavenly Father. And he says that this Father is over all. He's over all. He's in charge, not us. So we obey Daddy's rules. We obey His commands. We align our hearts with His. And if we're aligning our hearts with His, what inevitably happens? Well, all of a sudden, you and I, who were so far apart, no matter how different we were, all of a sudden, we're in alignment and in sync. Why? Because we've aligned our hearts with the one who never changes. Not only is he overall, it says he is through all. See, God is working through each of us. This is where our differences not only don't hinder unity, they actually work toward greater unity. Because as Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 12, even though we're all one body, we all have different roles to play in that body. Each part of the body is vital for the productivity and the flourishing of the body. Listen, the foot can't say to the hand, I don't need you. No, we need hands and feet to function optimally. And if they're not working together, it actually inhibits the body. There are also lots of parts of the body that we don't typically even think about because they're hidden. But imagine the body without lungs or a heart or a digestive tract, or a liver. These are parts of the body we don't give much attention to until there's something wrong, and then we realize just how vital they are to our existence. And it's the same with the church. Every single person in here who is a disciple of Jesus Christ has at least one spiritual gift and is essential to the optimal flourishing of this church body. God is working through them. Friends, that means you need them. In fact, the very thing that drives you crazy about them right now might actually turn out to be the exact way God uses them as he refines them to bless the body in a manner that you can't. So once again, pray for them. Be patient with them. Bear with them. Serve them. Help them to grow in their giftedness for the sake of the kingdom. Because our Father is over all, He is through all, but finally Paul says He is in all. Again, the same God who dwells within you dwells within them. That means everyone whose faith is in Christ now houses the very God of the universe. And as we as the people of God come together, that's where the fullness of his presence dwells. And if he is with us and if he is for us, what can stand against us? Brothers and sisters, that means you better not go after anybody who he is with and he is for because then you won't stand a chance. So love your brother. Love your sister even when they are not all that lovable because, again, you weren't so lovable when God first loved you. But now God is bringing us together in love to restore the shalom on earth that was broken in the garden. This is the purpose. This is the design of the church. The reason we have been saved by grace to grow as a family in perfect relationship with each other because we are in perfect relationship with him. This is the walk that lives up to the calling that we receive. This is what it means to be worthy of the calling because it reveals our heart is aligned with the heart of God. You know, at the end of Saving Private Ryan, Ryan in his old age is visiting the grave marker of Captain Miller, and he tells him, I've tried. I've tried to live my life the best I could. I hope that was enough. I hope that at least in your eyes, I earned what all of you have done for me. And then he turns to his wife, and with tears in his eyes, he cries out, tell me I've led a good life life. Tell me I'm a good man. Friend, on that day, I don't know about you, but when we stand before the Lord, not by our merit, but his, 
Not by our work, but his. Not in our righteousness, but his. But nevertheless, transformed by his merit, transformed by his work, transformed by his righteousness. I don't know about you, but I pray the fruit of my life will show that I belong to him. I hope I hear the words, well done, good and faithful one. You lived your life in accordance with the grace you received. You lived worthy to the calling to which you were called by grace. You were walking, you were walking worthy of that calling. And what is the evidence of this? What does he say will bring that about? Paul says it's not just that the big time sins were absent from your life, although as we're going to see later, Paul deals with that too. But what is his focus in this passage? What is the evidence that you belong to him? What is proof that you are walking worthy? He says that you are working, you are laboring for the unity of the church. You put other people's interests before your own. You show patience to one another. You bear with one another. You walk humbly and gently with one another. Because friends, God takes the unity of his church seriously. He does not tolerate any division because a divided church is promoting a false gospel. Because if we are in Christ, he has torn down every dividing wall. He's making into one new people, people from all different backgrounds who in any other context would have nothing to do with each other. But now that they are in Christ, all those differences seem small and trivial. Why? Because they both have him. They both belong to him. And if they both belong to him, they belong to each other. And if they both are loved by him, they will love each other. And if they are both following him, they will walk with each other patiently, lovingly, worthily. Because that's what we're called to. Church, by his design, by his grace, for his glory, let us be a people marked by a walk that is worthy of a calling. Walk worthy of the calling. Will you pray with me?